Good morning, and welcome to the sanctuary of Cornerstone Assemblies of God. I am Pastor Richard T. Wade, and I would like to say thank you for joining us today. I pray the Word of God can speak to you, and the Holy Spirit make it real to you. Now, a pre-recorded message from Cornerstone Assemblies of God. So anyway, tonight um, we are looking at the Great Commission and the Great Commandment and looking at uh, inv- a vision and vision and what one person, one person can make a difference and some, some idea on the personal responsibility of corporate worship. Say what? Yeah, a personal and individual responsibility on the corporate level. And so we're looking at that tonight. But before I get into the teaching, I want us to pray. Uh, the Stanleys are not here tonight. Uh, Stanley Seniors, Stanley Juniors right there, you know. And so Stanley Seniors, that's Frankie and Tommy. Uh, their AC went out. And so Tommy got back today and he landed on his flight from Alaska and is working on the air conditioner in their house. And um, apparently the refrigerator and freezer under their carport went out during the storm. Frankie checked it and heard it running, and it is running, but it's not getting cold. So she's got a freezer and a refrigerator with two-week-old nasty in it. And the air is fixed now? Praise the Lord. All right, well, an hour or so, two hours ago, she was like, here's just where I am. I'm cleaning and we tired. And I'm like, hey, you're good. You're, you're excused. This will give you an excused absence on this one. And so, but just be praying for them. But I'm, I'm excited to hear that. Uh, Shay was saying their, electric, uh, their AC went out, but praise the Lord, got fixed. So in the name of Jesus, air conditioners work. Amen. Y'all's. This morning, what happened to the air conditioners this morning? Mm -hmm. Three church members, air conditioners go all out in the same morning. Better get that devil out of there. (laughs) Amen. So, well, let's pray for these situations. Amen. And pray for Jason as well. Pray for Brother James. Amen. Amen. And so, Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, Lord, and we just magnify your holy name. Lord, tonight, Father, three air conditioners with issues within this congregation. And so, Father, whatever this is, this, this attack, this frustration, this, I believe it's a ploy of the enemy because we were bold enough to pray that mechanics would work Sunday. And so by Wednesday, the devil wants to get in our mechanics. And so you're bound in Jesus' name. And the Lord is Lord over all. And these compressors and air conditioners and fuses and breakers and everything in between work in Jesus' name because all your components belong to the Lord. And we give you the glory for that. Father, for those who are sick in their body, Lord, we believe for a physical healing. Lord, for those who have family members who are sick, those who are not here due to strep throat and whatever this crud is that's been going around, Father, we believe for total restoration in their body. Father God, we just pray that you would knit our hearts together, that we possess the land in which you have given us, that you are the God of peace and you are the God of joy. And I pray, Lord, that you reign supreme in all of those areas. Tonight, Lord, as we look at what your word says about being on mission, following your commandment, and having vision. We just ask, God, that your word is made clear unto us and that our hearts and minds are knitted together that we can go forward and be who you've called us to be. Lord, tonight we just give you all glory and honor in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. And so praise the Lord and welcome, welcome to church. Um, I I don't want to take up too much time, but I've just, my, my brain is, I've got like five wheels of spinning. (laughs) <laughs> and I don't have many more wheels than that, so I got them all in, in gear. We are, uh, just by way of announcement, uh, think hopefully, prayerfully, we've got internet stuff fixed after today. They came out and worked, and we had to do some stuff, and so we're, we're hoping and praying that it's, it's fixed. But 
uh, moving into the rest of the summer, we are going to live stream Sunday mornings for the evangelistic side of it. And we do have a pretty decent following of -of out-of-towners that watch us on Sunday morning live while we're having church. And then several others who follow up later on in the week. But on Sunday night, um, we are probably going to stop live streaming. And this is why, is the Lord has been dealing with me about some teachings. Uh, Teachings on deliverance, teaching on prayer, teaching on power and authority. And it's not that what I'm saying isn't beneficial for those who are outside our congregation I just don't want to give the enemy room to work and sow division. It's things that we as a congregation need to know and study and understand. And then when we maybe finish the complete series, take those teaching videos and put those on one of our websites or something like that where they are accessible in the future. But while we're in the midst of the teaching, I think it would be wise, it's just something I feel in my spirit, to protect the content of what is being taught and brought forward within just these walls. And so if you want to be a part of those teachings, be here on Sunday night. And so if you can't be here, I'll get you scriptures so that you can get caught up. Anyway, great commission, great commandment. Want to look at some things. Our mission is the great commission. If you're the mission of the church, the mission of the individual believer... If it steps outside the great commission that Christ has given us, then we, we, we've got a problem because if Jesus had a mission that he commissioned us with, with some of his last words spoken before he ascended to the right hand of the Father, then they're probably important. And so I want to start out tonight just by looking at Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. Uh, really, I'm going to go ahead and back up to 18, if, you, if that's not too much trouble, Mary. Sorry about that. I told you 19 through 20. But I want to go ahead and read verse 18. Matthew 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of of the age. And so before I go into the teaching and look at some things here, I want us just to kind of walk through these very verses and see where Jesus is and see where we should be as a body of believers and what our day-to-day mission should be. You heard me say that right. Our day-to-day mission is not just a Sunday morning thing. It's not just a Wednesday night thing. It's a Thursday morning thing. It's a Monday afternoon thing. It's it's an everyday thing. This is is our mission. I have had several people over the last several years. This isn't just a cornerstone thing. It happens here, but I guess it's probably happened at every church I've ever pastored. People are burdened trying to figure out what God wants them to do, and I'm like, this is what he wants you to do. He wants you to go into the world and be a witness and tell people that Jesus loves them and that Jesus died for them and that no matter what their situation is, Jesus can set them free. Jesus can change their life. That is your plan. You know, we get caught up. We talked about this briefly in a uh, board meeting just last night. People get caught up on all these titles and positions, and they they want their business cards, and I'm a this, and I'm a that, and I go this, and I do that. What happened to just being blood-bought and born again and just tell somebody Jesus loves you? You know, (laughs) when I first become a preacher, young and arrogant and stupid, no longer arrogant, I'm getting less young, I can still be stupid some days. But hey, at least, you know, two out of the three I've got improvement on. (laughs) You know, but (laughs) young, arrogant, and stupid. Well, I got me business cards right off the bat. 
and I put reverend on them, you know, Reverend Richard T. Wade. And on my Bibles, I had my name put on there, Reverend Richard T. Wade, Reverend, Reverend, Reverend. Well, my grandmother and I had a difference of opinion and doctrine, and I won't get into all that. But one day she saw my Bible, and she saw that it said Reverend Richard T. Wade on there. And boy, she got boiling mad. And I mean just boiling mad. And she said, that's a shame. That's blasphemous. I said, ma'am, that's blasphemous. Reverend Wade. She says, there's nothing reverent about you. She says, he is the reverent God. You are but man, flesh and bone. No reverend. And I was like, ouch. <laughs> Thankfully, I had a black leather Bible, so I went and got a Sharpie, and I scribbled over reverend, and it just said Richard Wade on it. And so I took reverend off of it, you know. And so I'm like, all right. I mean, my memo didn't got on me, you know. And so, <laughs> and so, so you know, I, I erased reverend off of everything. Now, with the assemblies, all of my official paperwork that comes from the assemblies of God, if you're credentialed with them, all the mail says Reverend Richard T. Wade. Even Allie, her stuff, because her credentials, it's Reverend Allie Wade. And it's like, okay. I've never sat easy with that. So people are like, what do I call you, Reverend, Brother? Pa? I'm like, you just call me Richard. My name is Richard. And then I don't want no title, no more. My mamma done broke me of a title. I don't need no title. I'm just Richard. And I'm just Richard. And so, yeah, people call me pastor. I am a pastor. But I'm, I don't make nobody call me anything. I'm, I'm Richard, and I'm not offended when somebody calls me Richard. Uh, you know, some people say, yeah, but you're the pastor, so they need to call you Brother Wade or Brother Richard or Pastor or this or that. And that's fine. I'm okay with it, but don't call me Reverend, okay? No, don't call me Reverend. Just call me Richard. But what I want to talk to you here about is we get so caught up on the fleshly desires. We get caught up on some kind of position. Well, if we're born again, then we're a child of God. We're a joint heir with Christ Jesus. What other position do we want than to be seated together with Him in the heavenly places? Well, talking about our day-to-day -day thing, you have a purpose. But I love that Jesus says in verse 18, He says, All authority has been given to me, in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore. And so what that go, therefore, tied directly to him letting them know all authority has been given unto me on heaven and earth. Go, therefore. What he is telling the disciples, he's telling the followers who are there in his presence is all authority in heaven and earth belong to me. Now in that authority, you go into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to do all that I have commanded you to do. And so we get hung up on this, and, and you've heard me talk about it before, and I don't mean to sound like I'm beating, beat, blah, 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 beating a dead horse, but we have... Over, I think, simplified the Great Commission. Now, some people get nervous and say, well, you sound like you're trying to complicate things. Well, I'm not trying to complicate things. But the Great Commission here is to go and to make disciples. Well, we've gone all over the world and had huge crusades and told people on the count of three, raise your hands. All right, you've accepted Jesus. Now you're born again. Pack up our crusade tent and come back home. And praise the Lord, we had 7 million saved. Well, praise God, but that's not the Great Commission. It is not go and make converts. It's go and make disciples. And so those 7 million people that come to an altar and accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, glory to God for it. But now what are we doing 
to back up the conversion? What are we doing to support them in the moment shortly after when they're still needing deliverance and freedom and counsel and we wonder why people get quote unquote saved and then all of a sudden they're right back in the pit that they got saved from because they never received godly counsel. They never understood the depth of the word. When you don't give them a sword, how do you expect them to defend themselves? You know, you commission them as a soldier of the kingdom, throw them out into the midst of a warfare, and you didn't even give them armor or a weapon and wonder why they died. It's because we missed the Great Commission. It wasn't to go and get everybody in town born again. It was to make them students of the Word. That's the Great Commission. And so we miss that. I wish I knew the brother's name to quote him, but it was said by a missionary to Africa. He said, we have over-evangelized the world too lightly. And I'm like, you know, that, that's the truth. That's exactly what we've done. Over-evangelized the world too lightly. We've told them about Jesus, but we've done nothing to help them grow in Jesus. It's one thing <laughs> if I want to introduce you to somebody who, you know, and I walk you in a busy, busy room full of, you know, 500 people, and I say, hey, Ricky, I need you to meet somebody. Hey, Ricky, this is Leslie. Leslie, this is Ricky. And then I just walk off, and then there, you go about your day, you go about your day, and then you know, six months later, I meet up with Ricky, and I said, hey, did you, did you do da-da-da-da-da-da? Did you talk to Leslie about that? No, man. I mean, I, you, you literally told me her name and pointed her out to me. You led me to her, but I didn't know what to ask. I didn't know what to do. I, I didn't even really know who. I just, you just, well, we, we, we do the same thing with lost people. We bring them to the foot of the cross and say, that's Jesus, have a good day, and walk on. There's Jesus. Look at me. I pointed six million people to Jesus. Well, how many did you make to know Jesus? How many people have you trained to trust Jesus? How, how many people have you walked alongside and reminded them that Jesus is faithful and he'll stick closer than a brother? Have we armed them with the arsenal that is available unto us in the Word of God? You know, when we were doing the early morning prayers in here, I've said this before, but one of the blessings of that was not just the fellowship with the handful of people who was in here, but Brother Russell, because he's deaf, he uh, prays really loud. And so, because he can't hear himself, and so he has to speak loud enough that he can hear himself. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But when he's praying in the morning, I'm sitting back here, and he was over here, and he's praying over his children and his grandchildren and he's calling them out by name and he's praying about situations. But he, then he begins to pray the armor of God. And he begins in his prayer to put on the armor of God. And he puts on that armor of God and he puts that armor of God on his grandchildren and his children and, 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 and he prays this over them. And that was a blessing to me because while he was praying for somebody else, I'm like, I'm just going to let Brother Russell just pray the armor of God on me. And so that's, you know, I just sit back there and shut my mouth and just let Brother Russell pray the armor of God on me. And because, you know, we, we needed to understand that there's more to this than just putting on my blue jeans and boots. I got to gird myself. I got to put on righteousness and faith and my feet have to be prepared with the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. See, Jesus is the prince of peace. And if he has all authority that's been given unto him in heaven and on earth, and in that authority we have been commissioned to go into the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
I want to pause there. I said something about this a few weeks back. I do not believe, and if you disagree with me, it's okay, but I do not believe that water baptism saves you. I believe that faith in the finished work of Christ saves you. However, faith without works is dead. And if Jesus says, make disciples and baptize them, then it might be important that just as soon as you express faith in your soul and body and heart, that the first work of your faith is to step into the water and say, I am going to identify with Christ. I am burying the old me, and I am going to be raised in the newness of life so that the whole world knows that yesterday I was that guy, but today I am this guy. It is a, a faith work. It has to be I didn't set out to set doctrine tonight, but it has to be more important than some give credence to because if Jesus, being as intentional with his words as he was, and one of the last things he commissions the believers to do is to make disciples and baptize them, teaching them all things that he has commanded. All things. We don't get to leave stuff out. We don't get to cherry pick. And, and we don't get to decide that some of the word was for yesterday and some of it's for today. And, well, we don't do that stuff anymore. And, God don't work that way anymore. No, Jesus says, teach them everything I have commanded you. And so that's one reason this summer we're going to look at prayer. And I'm just going to go ahead and give a, 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 a disclaimer now. I'm not going to water it down because of our fear of being contradicted. If the word says it, I'm going to believe it. And if my experience looks different than what the word says, it's not that the word is wrong. It's my experience hasn't caught up with what God has a plan for. And so I think we've got to be a little bit more just plain Jane literal with the word of God. We try to make it so figurative that we have excused the miraculous clean out of it. And we just, well, you know, it kind of if, I mean, I know I haven't experienced that way. So God probably don't work that, uh, no, no. And so he's given us a commission to go into the whole world, baptizing them in the name of the Father show you here to make disciples baptize them teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded and then sometimes we just stop right there and there's another sentence that Jesus says he says and remember I am with you always even unto the end of this age so when we look at this we've got to tell people about Jesus we got to train people about Jesus. We got to baptize people into Jesus. We need to I'll teach them to observe. So observe is not to just know. Observe is to do. So don't just talk to them about the word. You walk the word out before them so that they can observe it. And while they observe you walking out the word, now they are learn how they too walk out the word. Oh yeah, and remember that Jesus is with you always, even unto the end of the age. 
The beautiful thing is, is this age that Jesus is speaking of has not come to the end yet. So guess what? Remember, Jesus is with you always. And so when we're on the mountaintop, Jesus is there. When we're in the valley, Jesus is there. When we feel like we're full of faith, he's there. When we feel like scum, he's there. Because remember, he's with you always. This is the great commission of the church. So what's our mission? What are we about? What are we supposed to be doing? Telling people about Jesus. Training people about Jesus. Letting them observe Jesus in us so that they can see how they should let other people observe Jesus in them. And good, bad, or indifferent, remember that Jesus is with us always. Always. We oftentimes in this Great Commission... It, it, it focuses on the belief system that Jesus taught, and it's established, and it's and 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 it's really it's it's, it's final. We try to decide what we're going to do, and I, I've been reading church leadership stuff, and I'll read the first two chapters of just about any book somebody gives me, and I mean that's about all I can commit to you. If it's really good, I'll finish it. But if it ain't, I'll get you about two chapters and I'll throw it on the bookshelf with the rest of them. I'm just being honest with you. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> so uh, I, 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 I skim through different books and looking at different things. I do, um, I don't know why I'm a weirdo. Um, I like statistics. I can read statistics all day long. And, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know, but I do. So Barna Research and the Pew Research, both of them, Barna is my favorite. Uh, I look at a lot of Barna Research. It's a Christian research company, um, and they, it's non-denominational. They go across the spectrum. They go around the world. Every review that they put out is based on 100,000 surveys. So if they say, well, 40% of Christians do da-da-da-da, they've asked at least 100,000 Christians across the nation from different church backgrounds. And so they didn't just all go to the Southern Baptist Convention and ask 300 people and come up with their numbers. And so it's well-rounded so you can kind of understand this is really what the American church is looking like. And what it's showing is over the last 20 years, the church has gotten so caught up in becoming a business that pastors walked away from being a pastor and they've become CEOs. And we've wondered why the spirituality of the church has bottomed out is because we're not addressing spiritual matters. We're trying to run a business. And it's that that's not how that's that's not what it is. And so in the dangers of running the business, yes, we got to have money. We just had a deacon meeting about this. Talking about, yeah, yeah, it takes money to pay the electric bill and do stuff like that. But if we get so bound and coming up with the next greatest business plan, what about putting same, that same, forth eff, same effort forth? Let me get my words right. To hear God... And to have the plan to conquer our territory. You know, I mean, I've been guilty of it. This isn't me casting stones. I've, 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 had, I've had those months where the only thing, I won't say the only, the thing that consumed my mind most of the time was the business of the church rather than the spirit of the church. And so Barna Research is showing that there has been a detriment to the spirituality of the church because the church will only go as the head goes. And if the pastor stops growing, how can he grow people if he's not growing or she's not growing? If there's no fire in me, how can I expect fire in you? If I'm not going to pray and seek God, 
how can I expect you to pray and seek God? If I'm not going to dig into his word, how can I expect you to dig in his word? If I don't walk in the authority that Christ has given me, how do I expect my people to walk in the authority that Christ has given them? And so it, that, that's how this thing works. That's the reason Paul says, look, you've been taught what to do. If you would just do what you've seen me do, because I'm just doing what Jesus has shown me to do. We, that, that's getting our minds back on the commission. Why are we here and what are we doing? We're making disciples. We're training them in the word. We're teaching them to not just know the word, but to do the word wasn't my intention to get off on that too much tonight but James makes it clear you can quote all the scripture you want but unless you're doing it you've deceived yourself now that's a sad place to be but if we're so busy in building our empire that we forget to build the kingdom of God we've lost our purpose and then I've heard it said before, sometimes you get in that mindset where you say, Lord, bless this mess. You know, because we, we worried about what we're building. What's he building? What's he doing? And if we're going where he's leading us, we don't have to cry out to him to bless the mess. Because with him, there ain't no mess. Say, what? Yeah, I didn't say you don't have trouble. I didn't say there won't be trials and tribulation. But trials and tribulation and trouble is different than just mess. He'll give you peace in the midst of a trial and tribulation. He'll convict you and correct you in mess. There's a difference. So the Great Commission focuses on the belief that Christ has put forth for the church. And what we often call the great commandment serves as a guide for those beliefs that he puts forth in the great commission. So in Matthew 22, in verse 37, Then Jesus said unto him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like this. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 40 goes on to say, And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. <laughs> so Jesus is saying, You can get out here and you can try to keep all the law you want. You can try to be as religious as you want. You can make up all the rules you want. You can do whatever you want. But there are two commandments that if you follow them, you will be complete in the word of God. Two. So we worry about the ten commandments, that, which I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't, but we worry about the ten. And the, the Jewish people was worried about their 613 fence laws and this, that, and the other. And then we might not be Jewish, we may be Christian, but then even within our own uh, circles, we come up with all of our fence laws, you know. You, you can't wear this, you can wear that, don't look this way, don't do that way, only paint your church this color, don't paint your church that color. Do we have chairs? Do we have pews? Do you have carpet? Do you not? Does your church look like a cathedral? Does your church look like a nightclub? This one's wrong, that one's wrong. You go to these leadership conferences, They give you 753 ways to have a successful church. None of them work. <laughs> I've tried every one of them. <laughs> well, none of them work. Pay a million dollars and beat your head against the wall. Jesus tells us right here in three verses everything it takes. He says, if you'd love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, I'm going to pause right there. That's the first one. Love the Lord with everything within you. Well, if God gets everything that I have, 
then I don't have room for self-centeredness because the Lord has filled up everything that's in me. If God has all of my heart and he has all of my soul and he has all of my mind, then how can I have a corrupt heart, a jacked up soul, and my mind consume with other things? It can't because it's full of God. So if my mind is in places it shouldn't be, then it's obviously not full of God. If my heart is bitter or twisted or darkened or hardened, then it's obviously not full of God. If my soul is vexed and I've got issues, then it's obviously not full of God. Because if it's full of God, it will not be vexed. My mind will not be confused and my heart will not be hardened if it is full of God. It can't be... I'm going to tell on my wife. I wish she was in here. But y'all will tell her anyway. It was really good. And this isn't a bad thing. It's just a funny thing. So we went to Lowe's today to get stuff for her um, addition to her chicken coop. You know, to add them a sunroom. And uh, that's facetious. But anyhow, basically. And so I went, went to Lowe's to get her stuff for her chicken coop. And while we were there to get stuff for the chicken coop, she says, I do want a door on the garage, too. Because Flash scratched that one up real bad. And she did that wife bat her eyes in that particular voice. And I said, all right, let's go get it. So I loaded it up. And we're pushing it back. And she said, you can tell me no if you want to. But over there by the pool, I would like some flowers for those pots and stuff. I said, what pots? Oh, you didn't know about those pots? <laughs> I said, okay. So we went and got the flowers for the pots. You can tell me no if you want to. No, go on, baby. So we went and got them, and we're driving home, and <laughs> Well, I'll just tell you information that's not any of your business. It was $625, all of it total. And so we're driving home, and I looked over at her, and I said, I tell you what, I wasn't even going to say anything about that. I was actually going to make another comment. And she just turned and looked at me. She says, you remember that golf club set? The Lord as my witness. That was not what was coming out of my mouth. But she was so ready and primed for me to gripe about her spending so much money at Lowe's. She already had her rebuttal. You remember that set of golf clubs? <laughs> if her heart was full of God, she wouldn't be over there pondering how she can come back. If her mind had been fixed on Jesus, she wouldn't have been thinking of all the things I've blown money on to make it okay that she blew money. That's how we do in our sin. I mean, I know I sinned, but you know what Brother Russell did? You know what I mean? We got to, no, 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 no. What Brother Russell got to do with my sin? What my golf club set got to do with your flowers and chicken coop? I've never played a game with them. That's what she's so frustrated about. Three years ago, I decided I was going to have a Sabbath day and play golf with all the other preachers in the region. So I spent $1,000 on a set of golf clubs. Cobra. And they've never made it to the golf course. Not one single time. They sit in my garage. Never. I hit a woofer ball with them in my backyard one time. <laughs> so she went on to say that, you know, at least her chicken coop is going to produce us eggs. Hey, 
They do. So, uh, so Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God and your husband and wives and their bad habits sometimes. No. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. When we truly are fixed on the Lord in all three of those areas, not just one or the other, all three of them. Because our heart can be good, but then our soul be vexed. Our soul can be good and our heart can be good, but our mind is corrupt. And if we're not careful with how corrupt the mind is, the heart will be heartened, and then you end up with a vexed soul. But if they're all three full, because we've given it all to the Lord our God, then I'm not too concerned about what I want. What does he want? What pleases him? What is his goal for my life? And then verse 39, it goes on and saying the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so if I've given God everything that I have, and now I view myself as God views me, I love myself as God loves me, I'm living my life as God has willed for me to live my life, it is no longer my will be done, but yours, O oh Lord. And then I am loving my neighbor with that same love now that God has imparted in myself for myself. Well, then I'm not, well, you know those golf clubs. Don't worry about my sin. Let me talk about your sin. Let me do this or let me do that. But what about me? But what about my wants? A perfect example or what I think is a perfect example of this uh, when we first got married, this isn't a me and Allie story. This is a her family story. When we first got married, we went out to eat with her sister and brother-in-law, and I'd tell this if they were sitting here. And they had, I don't know, maybe two of their three kids. I don't think we yet had Cooper. We may have. And we were sitting at a dining table, eating. It was a Mexican restaurant. And as two-year-old and four-year-old kids do they had made a mess um, Harrison was like a bull in a china cabinet and so there was more rice under his high chair than it made it into his mouth there were refried beans smeared you know on the table uh, Catherine had done the same there were chips that had gotten crumbled and was around and the table was a wreck and we're getting ready to leave and they just pack up their bags and they're walking out the restaurant and I've got Allie stacking up plates and I've got napkins and I'm wiping the table off and I'm on my hands and knees sweeping up as much rice and chips as I can and of course the little uh, dining lady she's saying don't worry about it I'll get it I'll get it I said I know you will but I I'm, no you won't because I'm going to and I'm, I'm cleaning up my mess. And Afton and Sumner were out in the drive, and they're like, where'd they go? And so they come back in. They're like, what are y'all doing? I said, I'm cleaning up after my children and yours. I wasn't as diplomatic back then. <laughs> and they said, well, you know how many people left messes like this? When I was waiting tables, it's just part of the job. That's how they said it. I said, how did you feel when you were waiting tables and people left messes like this? Well, it irritated me. I said, then get your butt in this floor and get this rice cleaned up. And I said it just like that. Because I take it literally. When he says, love your neighbor as yourself... If you didn't like it when somebody left the tables messy when you was bussing tables, then when you get up from a table at a restaurant, it ought to be the best bus table in the restaurant. 
If you, when you were waiting tables, didn't get liked, you didn't like being stiff to tip, you ought to be the best tipper in the restaurant. You know, I mean, I run a construction company and I couldn't, it, it burnt me up when somebody says, will you come do a job for me? Yes, I will. Well, how much is it going to cost? It's going to cost $1,000. Will you do it for eight? If I do it for eight, I told you I'd do it for eight. I said I'd do it for a thousand. So by you saying, will you do it for eight, you're implying that I'm adding extra on and I'm trying to rip you off by 200 bucks. That's what you're implying. I ain't saying that. Yes, you are. No, the bill's a thousand dollars. Shut up and pay it or I ain't doing it. So Allie gets on me. Well, you didn't even try to Jew them down. I sure didn't. I sure didn't. How much you going to charge me? 1500 All right. Well, you, you could have got that cheaper. Maybe I could have. But I know how it makes me feel when people try to chingle me. I ain't going to do that to nobody else. I got kinfolk. If they're selling something, it's the best thing in the world. But if they're buying it, it's junk. Well, if it was junk when you bought it, it's junk when you're selling it. Just love your neighbor as yourself. Where are you going with this? Well, here's the thing. Me and my father-in-law, we get to talking sometimes. We get talking about people getting so bent out of shape over so many things within the church. How about we just try loving our neighbors as ourself? And then once we get that one under control, then we can go somewhere else. Pastor, what do you think, you know, in the book of Daniel when it says this? And, I mean, you know, are you reading in the book of Revelation and it says, you know, that he swooped down with his tail. I, I'm picking on y'all. And he takes one-third of the stars with him. What? Do, are you loving your neighbor as yourself? I'm not telling you not to study. I'm not telling you don't know things. I'm not telling you that. But I know people who will spend all their Bible study time trying to figure out something that's going to happen in the future and they don't know how to love their neighbor as themselves right now. You ain't going to have to worry about what's going on in heaven because you ain't going to make it because you ain't loving your neighbor as yourself. Who cares what the new heavens and the new earth is going to look like? You're going to hell because God ain't got all you full up. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, you know, let's re be real simple about it, you know. How about we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind? How about we love our neighbor as ourself? Get over it. <laughs> I'm not trying to meddle. I'm really not. I'm not even trying to be hard tonight. <laughs> we have a mission. And it's the same for all of us to tell the world about Jesus, to train them in the Word of God, to be a witness and to do the Word that we know to do, and then to give God everything we've got and love our neighbors as we love ourselves. I have a friend, I used to have a friend, who'd go down the road and empty out their console, throwing it out the window. <sighs> Burn me up. I made them turn around a few times. That's the reason I ain't their friend no more. <laughs> they kicked me out and told me not to get back in. Why? Well, it goes back to this love your neighbor. About twice a week, I go out in my ditch, and I pick up all the trash that somebody else has thrown in my yard and you know what? I don't like it. So why in the world would I throw something in somebody else's ditch? I also find it appeasing that now people know that I'm the preacher that lives in that house. I've found more and more beer cans than I ever had before. I thought about buying a pickup truck and just starting to throw in all those beer cans over in the back of my truck just to see what people would say. <laughs> Look at all them beer cans in the back of the preacher's truck. <laughs> <laughs> get some gossip going around town because if the Lord had you all full up you wouldn't have time to talk about it <laughs> so 
So the Great Commission, the Great Commandment. Tell the whole world about the Lord. Train them to be students of the Word. Baptize them. Put some action to their faith. Help them to observe everything the Lord teaches. And remember that Jesus is with you always, even unto the end of the age. And then love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and with all your mind. Then love your neighbor as yourself. Because on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So you want to know the mystery of the word of God? You want to know the secret on how to be a doer of the word and to fulfill the law of God? You love him with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and you love your neighbor as yourself. If you've got the love and proper perspective of all three, four areas, heart, soul, mind, and neighbor, you're not going to have a sin problem. You're not going to have a forgiveness problem. You're not going to have a bitterness problem. You're not going to have it. Because God will be fully enveloped in all areas of our existence. I don't have time tonight to get over into vision. But Proverbs 29 verse 18 makes it plain. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But happy is he who keeps the teaching. You've got to have vision. You've got to know where you're going. You've got to know what God's plan is. Well, I just told you what God's plan is. Happy are those who continue in the teaching. That's happier are those who continue in studying the word of God. When you've given the Lord all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind, you will long for communion with him. And that communion will look like prayer. That communion will look like Bible study. That communion will look like literally pondering meditation. Some people don't like the word meditation because it's tied to other things. But just the muddling of the word and the thought of God in our mind. Instead of being absent-minded, don't go brain dead. Just ponder on God. I guess it was a couple of days ago. I was sitting in the backyard, and I had, a, I guess, a look on my face. And Allie asked me, she says, what are you thinking about? I said, what? She says, I don't know where you were, but you were gone. You were there. <laughs> it, it wasn't just down the road. I said, I was just pondering the Lord. Well, what would he tell you? Well, I mean, nothing that I can really even share. I just was pondering the Lord. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Where there's no vision, the people perish. But happy is he who keeps the teaching. If we keep the word, joy will be ours. Happiness is ours. Where we have vision and where we know where we're going, and the enemy can't come in, feed us a line, and steal what God's given us. And so I will continue on this later on, but I'm out of time. I won't keep you hostage. I hope this can encourage you tonight. If you don't really remember anything else I said tonight, remember this. The final statement of the Great Commission. And remember, Jesus is with you always, even unto the end of the age. Remember that Jesus is with you always. Amen. Thank you so much again for taking time to listen to a message from the sanctuary of Cornerstone Assemblies of God. We do this through the help of our listeners and friends in the community. If you would like to donate to our broadcast, you can go to cornerstoneatlanta.tv and give as the Lord would lead you. But again, I, Pastor Richard Wade of Cornerstone Assemblies of God, just say thank you for taking time, and I pray the Lord make this real to you today.